Okay, now, before I start to speak about today's topic, I have to make three distinctions because uh, I have found out that people have great trouble in distinguishing the words objective, subjective, and the words material and formal. Sometimes I have to point out that uh, anybody who is not subject to the Roman pontiff and who is not uh, in union with the church cannot be such this tape or listen to the, 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 the audio tapes. The reason, one of the reasons why we cannot positively state that this pope is, uh, that, that this pope is not pope is because, first of all, we need proof. We do not have this proof. Some people quote the, uh, the apostolic bull of Paul IV, cum ex apostolatu, against the, uh, the present pope, saying that Paul IV decreed that a heretic cannot become pope. Yes, but the papal election is an act of administration, not a sacrament. It is not a theological procedure. Therefore, there cannot be an infallible pronouncement on it. It is an act of administration, just like, like all elections. When in a monastery an abbot is elected, this is a canonical election. The election of the supreme pontiff among the cardinals is a canonical election. And those rules can not only be changed, but were changed a couple of dozen times over in church history. Leo XIII changed the rules. Pius X changed the rules. Pius XI changed the rules again. Pius XII changed the rules again. Paul VI changed it. And the present pope changed it again. And none of them has ever uh, quoted Paul IV again on this. Now, the bull, who makes apostolato, is an infallible bull as far as the doctrinal statements are concerned. It cannot be infallible as far as an administra uh, administrative uh, 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 rule is concerned, saying that if a cardinal was a heretic, even when he was a heretic and converted, he cannot be validly elected pope. To be validly elected pope, you need positive human law, a law of administration. And that every single pope can change, much unlike the uh, doctrinal laws, which no pope can change ever. If a pope decides forever on a moral issue, his successor cannot change it. Impossible. He will put himself in schism with the church. But an, a rule of administration and how it can be changed, and how. In the beginning, the people of Rome elected the pope. Later on, it was uh, the clergy of Rome. And very much later on, only uh, uh, 1,300 years after Christ died and resurrected and founded his church at Pentecost, cardinals were the only ones to elect the pope. So if a future pope says, I don't want cardinals to elect the pope, but uh, all of the, uh, the bishops in the world, he's going to make a mess. But that doesn't make the election invalid, because it's a, it would be horrible. Not to, uh, I don't want to think of it. But... Uh, it doesn't make the election duly procedures required and, and provided. Uh, it doesn't make it invalid because it's an act of administration. And that's why I recommend the Sede Vacantis to be a little more careful with their judgment. The Society of St. Pius X is not exactly composed of all idiots, and none of them nowadays uh, uh, considers the Apostolic See vacant. And the three priests, Father Sanborn, Kelly, and Cicada, unfortunately, because they're otherwise very good theologians, unfortunately had to be kicked out of the Society of St. Pius X for insisting on the fact that we do not have a Pope. To me, this is a neurotic statement, too, because you put yourself in a dead end. Who's going to elect the next Pope? I'll leave the question to you. Now, we are in the topic already. I mentioned the Society of St. Pius X, and Father Trainshirt pointed out to you that you will not be excommunicated if you uh, use the services of the Society of St. Pius X. Why is this so? Now, I have to presume that you will see the tapes of my conference on Thursday, Fridays, and yesterday. Uh, I do not have the time to repeat everything I said there, so there will be a lot of references to my first, second, and third lecture. In my first lecture, I explained to you how the crisis came about. In my second lecture, I explained to you uh, what is wrong with the new Mass, and yesterday I explained to you what is wrong with Vatican II. And uh, in near future, you will get a complete list of all the quotations of Vatican II, which are definitely unacceptable to a Catholic. And uh, just reading those quotations, you will be able to see what I mean. You will be, even though you're not learned theolog theologians, you will be able to use my list to see and understand what I mean. I'll give you one example. We have that much of time. Lumen Gentium 16 says that the Muslims, together with us, adore one merciful God. This is blasphemy and heresy, because it might as well be that the individual Muslim 
tries to find the real one God. But uh, the council says the Muslims, capital letter in, la capital letter in Latin, Musulmani nobiscum adorant unum Deum. They do not adore one merciful God with us, but against us, because they deny the incarnation and they deny the blessed Trinity, and they use words which I don't want to repeat here to describe with the idea of the Trinity. And Vatican II has the blasphemous uh, uh, audacity to speak about them and the Jews praying to the same God we do. <coughs> This is a thoroughly and entirely Masonic concept that cannot be uh, accepted by any Catholic. The Muslims are not only heretics, they are pagans. And they do not adore our God because they do not adore Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Anybody who says they adore the same God we do because they are uh, nobiscum, together with us, not along with us, as one smart Alec translated, together with us is nobiscum. If you say they adore one merciful God together with us, then you sin against the first commandment gravely. We adore Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and Son incarnated man. The Word has become flesh. You see, the situation is a disaster, and that's to say the least. So in 1970, French seminarians of the uh, Seminaire Francais in Rome uh, were threatened uh, with being kicked out of the seminary for the simple reason that they wanted to say the rosary and wear the cassock. So uh, they did not accept that, of course, and they uh, asked uh, Archbishop Lefebvre, who at this time was contemplating to retire and live the rest of his life uh, in uh, pension in Rome, they were asking Archbishop Lefebvre for help. Archbishop Lefebvre uh, was not very convinced at first that he should do that, but however, they insisted, especially a certain Monsieur Tissier de Malaret, who is now Bishop Tissier de Malaret, insisted and kept insisting, and uh, together with him, uh, another French priest who is now at the moment the uh, um, uh, first, uh, the second advisor, general advisor to the Society of St. Pius X. So they found a house in Fribourg in Switzerland, and Bishop Henri Charrier of Fribourg, Lausanne, and Sion at the same time, uh, gave them an official church blessing to found the society, the priestly society of St. Pius X. And uh, so it was an, a, a work of the church, legally, regularly founded by a diocesan bishop in Switzerland. And the society was canonically, therefore, canonically means according to the regulations of, of the Code of Canon Law, canonically erected in 1970. And... Uh, after uh, a while, Archbishop Lefebvre found the house, which is still the, the French-speaking the French main seminary today in Econ, that's in the uh, Rhone Valley in Switzerland, the French-speaking part. And uh, it was about after one and a half years that Rome found out that they are celebrating the Old Mass and they are teaching all this old stuff with Vatican II who I wanted to do away with. So they sent in three investigators, Cardinal Garon, Cardinal Wright, and Cardinal Tabera, who, quote-unquote, investigated. Uh, right there in the place, they all gave praise on the whole outfit and said, this is beautiful, wonderful, everything according to the canonical regulations. I wish we had that elsewhere. Back in Rome, they said the exact contrary, which is typical for conciliar methods. You lie, cheat, and swindle. When you read Vatican II and its footnotes, you will find out that they lied, cheat, and swindle. They, in one and the same sentence, footnote at the end, they quote the guy, a church father or somebody else, quote it in the footnote in the first half of the sentence, and then they say the contrary in the second half of the sentence, and put the footnote at the, after the second half of the sentence, quoting, for example, in uh, Gaudium et Spes 22.2, the church father Justinus, Contrary to what Justinus said, this is the method of Vatican II and the Novus Ordo Church, the counterfeit church out there. Uh, they reported to Rome that this is not a, that the, the seminary in Econ was not according to uh, the standards of Vatican II, etc., etc. You can you can very well imagine what they said, and so Rome said we're going to shut down this thing. Archbishop Lefebvre, contrary to canon law, never even got a hearing let alone a cause at the, at, the, at the competent church tribunal. Never anything. 
You can read this in detail in one of the books available at the, at the book stands of the Society of St. Pius X. Archbishop Lefebvre was not even heard, which is against canon law. And then uh, the official closed down of the Society of St. Pius X, not by the Pope, but by the Secretary of State, was silently acknowledged by Pope Paul VI, and Archbishop Lefebvre, the person concerned, never had had a chance to defend himself. So this is the methods of, as Father Trinchard pointed out, tyrants who do not, they use canon law when it serves their purposes. But they do not understand canon law, they do not understand uh, divine law, they do not understand eternal law, and they do not understand the meaning of law itself, the purpose of law, justice. So uh, the Society of St. Pius X went on all the same. Rome explicitly forbade Archbishop Lefebvre to ordain priests. However, in 1976, he did ordain priests against the explicit instruction of Rome, and so they suspended him a divinis. That means he was further on, according to uh, what Rome uh, believed, further on he was not allowed to say Mass except privately, and he was not allowed to give the sacraments except uh, in, uh, uh, in the case of emergency. And this is exactly what we are in. We are in a case of emergency. The Church provides jurisdiction, read canon law, the new code of canon law confirms what I say. I do not have to quote the old canon law to make my point. The new code of canon law affirms in several canons the old law of emergency. Now, why are we in an emergency? Well, listen to my lecture 1, 2, and 3, and you will see we are definitely in an emergency with 99% uh, of the hierarchy preaching heresy. You need Catholic priests. You do not want to go to confession to a priest who says, Oh, come on, that's not a sin. What's the matter with you? Today's priests tell young people in the confessional it's all right to go to bed before you're married. Wonderful. This is not what you want when you go to confession. You want to hear the Catholic moral theology, also because otherwise the absolution is, in, is invalid. So here, some people, some conservatives, I'm not a conservative, I warn you, I'm just plain Catholic. So some conservatives are worried about the jurisdiction of the Society of St. Pius X. They are absolutely not worried about priests who explain away sins at the confessional, which makes absolution invalid. They're absolutely not concerned and worried about priests who give general absolution, which in 99.999 cases is invalid, I know I have so far known only one single case of general absolution having been valid uh, uh, after the Second World War. And that was on a plane that was uh, threatened with a crash. And the priest got up, turned around, grabbed the microphone, and said, anybody who's a Catholic, do an act of contrition, ego vos absolvo peccatis vestris, and so on, gave general absolution. That's valid according to, to Pius XII. It's valid according even to the decrees of the present Pope. 99.9% .9 of all general absolutions are not valid. Nobody's hooked up with that problem. The conservatives are always worried about the jurisdiction of St. Pius X. Well, I tell you, the Society of St. Pius X gets the jurisdiction for absolution out of canon law. Not Canon law says jurisdiction can be given either by the competent authority or by the church itself. The church itself gives the... Uh, uh, jurisdiction for absolution or uh, for marriages, as a matter of fact, in certain cases. I'll give you one example. A priest on a ship has all faculties automatically. Sure, he's the only one who can be approached for confession. I mean, if you commit a mortal sin on a cruiser, and that's very easy with the temptations out there, uh, you don't want to die, then, you don't want to go to hell uh, in case you die the next day or the ship sinks. So you might want a priest to confess to. This priest usually does not have the, the faculties of confession out there on the ship because there's no bishop around who would give him the faculty. So the church gives the faculties. And in any case of emergency, not just in the case of danger of death. See, canon law speaks about the danger of death, but it speaks about emergencies. It does not exclude other emergencies because canon law is never exclusive without uh, explicitly saying so. That's one of the uh, first canons in the book. 
So the Society of St. Pius X has jurisdiction simply for the fact that there are no other Catholic priests, Catholic priests around are not enough. You have to get, you're not, as, as a Catholic, you are not under the obligation to take a plane into another city in this country to be able to find a Catholic priest for, for confessing, to, you want to confess to. That would be ridiculous. The church is never ridiculous because canon law can never be above the highest law of the church, canon 1725 of the new code of canon law. Suprema lex ecclesia salus animarum. This, the highest law of the church is the salvation of souls. It is absolutely and positively and definitely against the salvation of souls if you are, if you are uh, forced to confess to a heretical priest, to a priest who speaks heresy in the sermons, who celebrates the Novus Ordo Missa, which is illicit and against divine law, and who uh, gives the sacraments in the Novus Ordo, which is illicit and against divine law. You don't want to confess to this priest. So... Uh, Canon law cannot be above divine law. That's absurd. And Archbishop Lefebvre knew that, and this is why he was going on. And he went on and on, and then uh, he didn't get younger. So by the time it was 1988, uh, Archbishop Lefebvre was already uh, 83 years old. Now that's about usually the, usually the time to say goodbye to this world. Now Archbishop Lefebvre knew the moment he was dead, Nobody, no bishop, not a single one, would be willing to ordain young men to be Catholic priests. What, means, what does it mean, Catholic priests? Now, rest assured, I know the situation in seminaries all over the world, diocesan seminaries, very well. I could give you an explicit de description of what is going on <coughs> in modern seminaries, but I can't because there's ladies present. I'm not joking. I could not possibly, in front of a present lady, tell you what is going on in new seminaries, but take an educated guess on several perversions of the Sixth Commandment. There is no way a novus or the bishop, and except uh, for, uh, at the moment, um, um, five, six bishops at the moment, all others are novus or the bishops and are not willing to ordain a young man who refuses Vatican II, refer to my yesterday's lecture, and who refuses to Novus Ordo Missa, refer to my lecture on Friday. So you cannot become a Catholic priest if you accept Vatican II. I proved this yesterday. You cannot be a Catholic priest if you celebrate the Novus Ordo. I proved this yesterday, the day before yesterday. So we were in a situation in 1988 and this is before the fraternity of St. Peter and the Institute of Christ the King and similar organizations came about, mind you. We were in a situation that there were two bishops in the whole world willing to ordain Catholic priests. Oh, I shouldn't do this. Some people say I'm a mason if I do this sign. <laughs> I've learned my lectures. So two, oh no, uh, two. There were two bishops around who were willing to ordain young men who refused Vatican II and the Novus Ordo. If those two bishops had, if, if, mind you, if they didn't, if those two bishops had died and nobody else would have ordained priests according to the old laws of the church, the prophecy of Christ in Matthew 16, 18 would have turned out to be a lie. That cannot be. The moment Archbishop Lefebvre realized that if he did not ordain bishops, if he did not consecrate the bishop, bishops, apparently against the will of the Pope, I say apparently, I will explain it later, there would be nobody left. And he was dead right in the spot because both Archbishop uh, uh, Lefebvre and Bishop Castro Maya died in 19, uh, 1991, three years after. He had more than reasons enough to distrust Rome. There is the famous story of the, uh, the paper that... Uh, Archbishop Lefebvre signed the 5th of May, 1988, one, uh, two months before the, the, the bis Episcopal consecrations. In this paper, which is usually presented by the Vatican as an agreement, another lie, it was not an agreement, but the protocol of a conversation, a discussion. So when Archbishop Lefebvre, on the 5th of May, signed the protocol, he signed an, a, a protocol. That's what it was, a protocol not an agreement. 
And still he had to take back his signature later on because. Now, in this protocol, they discussed the possibilities of having an organization with the blessing of the Holy See to keep a, tradition, a traditional seminary and a traditional uh, rite of mass going as an exceptional thing, so to speak, as if the Novus Ordo Missa was ever a rite of the church, which is another lie. The Novus Ordo Missa is not a work of the church. It has no blessing from the church, and it is against divine law. I prove this. So the, the, the true rite of the Latin Roman Church, the Catholic Church of the Latin Roman Rite, is the old mass canonized forever by St. Pius V in 1570 with his decree, Gro Primum, which you will be able to read in Father Trinchard's book. And uh, so they had no right to give an exceptional permission. They should have done the opposite, done away with the, uh, with the new right and got the old right back. However, they offered Archbishop Lefebvre an organization of pontifical right headed by a commission of seven members. And now get this. By a commission of seven members, who would the seven members have been? Five chosen by the Vatican. The sixth one would have been the one bishop they would have ordained for that purpose, the very one bishop. And the seventh would have been a member chosen by the Society of St. Pius X. We live in a democrat... Well, I don't, I don't, but... Uh, <clears throat> the Novus Ordo people live in a democratic church. Now get this, five against two. And the bishop here would have been chosen by Rome, so six against one. It would have been a lot more honest to tell Archbishop Lefebvre, listen, uh, we will not give you a bishop, we will put you on the pontifical right, but we will, we will decide what, you will, what will go on. And the future, in 1988 it was future, and the future was to prove what Archbishop Lefebvre suspected. Because the Fraternity of St. Peter was promised a bishop. I can't see a bishop given to the Fraternity of St. Peter's yet. And we are almost ten years after that. The indult masses, like in Providence, Rhode Island, the indult mass, the priest has to give communion in the hand or he's not allowed to celebrate the mass there. Monsignor Perl, who is the, uh, in charge, the secretary of the Commission Ecclesia Dei, he asked the indult people in Vienna, Austria, said, why don't you give communion in the hand? It would make everything so much easier. This is what Archbishop Lefebvre predicted in 1988. So when he found out, he went back to Rome, he asked Cardinal Ratzinger, when are you going to give me this bishop? I'm not going to live for long anymore. And Cardinal Ratzinger said, oh, I can't give you a date. I can't give you an exact, exact date. Archbishop Lefebvre tried again. He said, well, how about the 15th of August? Can I rely on your consecrating a bishop for my purpose of the 15th of August? Oh, no, I, 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 I can't give you a, 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 a definite answer on that. But what do, you, what do you call that? In English, it's called stalling. And stalling usually has not exactly an honest purpose, except in war. So Archbishop Lefebvre said, okay... I see what's going on. Emergency applies. Emergency is there. We have a case of emergency. The rules for uh, self-defense, the rules for defense apply. And the 30th of June, 1988, he consecrated four bishops for a simple reason. It's very easy to rub out one bishop. I have lived in Rome for 15 years. I know people who are capable of doing this. There were three attempts on two of the paper of the Pope's secretary's lives. Three attempts. There was uh, one of the Pope's secretaries, a certain Monsignor Cabongo, somewhere in Africa, I don't remember which diocese. Monsignor Cabongo, pretty good man. If you handed him a letter for the Pope, he would hand the letter directly to the Pope and not to the Secretary of State for the trash can there, or the paper shredder. So they threatened him with life, and then they tried to kill him. He was one of those curious creatures who would drive a bicycle in Rome, which means a daring person. And uh, he left Porta Sant'Anna, and a car drove by and pushed him over, 
Luckily, Italian drivers are extremely fast in reaction. The front tire of a huge truck was right here. So uh, they wanted to give Archbishop Lefebvre one bishop. I once discussed this with Bishop Fillet, and I said, I hope it is not allowed to you to travel on the same plane, all the four of you. And he said, no, we are not allowed to. You get why? Planes have been bombed for lesser reasons, like life insurance, cashing life insurance, or getting rid of a politician over Bosnia, or trying out what would be the reaction of the people with a TWA flight over the Atlantic. Huh? So, um, there are some people in the Vatican who would not shrink from murder. And Archbishop Lefebvre realized he needed four bishops because by 1988 his organization was worldwide. And he has a bishop in Argentina and he has a bishop in the United States, Bishop Williamson in Winona, the local seminary. He has a bishop in uh, Switzerland who is now the secretary general. And he has a second bishop in Switzerland, uh, Monsignor uh, Tessier de Malaret, whom I mentioned before. And those two bishops in Switzerland are not always in Switzerland because they have to do an awful lot of traveling all over the world. Last time I met Filet, he had just been coming back from somewhere, I remember, I remember not, yes, the Philippines. So, these, these four bishops, thank God they're young, but these four bishops are under a constant stress, they're in constant traveling, and uh, I thank the Lord we have six bishops now because there's the fifth one, Monsignor Angel, in the Diocese of Campos in Brazil, which would be a story for another lecture. And uh, Monsignor Lasso, a retired bishop from the Philippines, God bless him, who has joined the Society of St. Pius X. This emergency, which can easily be proven in canon law, this emergency caused Rome to found a new organization, the Fraternity of St. Peter. Some of the priests, most of them, by the way, not in disagreement with the consecrations, the Episcopal consecrations, that's another one of those tiny little dishonesties, or deviations from truth, or as you put it in political correct speak, untruth. Uh, these, most of them didn't leave the, for the, the Society of St. Pius X because they were against the Episcopal consecrations, but because they wanted, had it, wanted to leave anyway. So then now they had a new chance. And uh, the Fraternity of St. Peter, was founded for the only and exclusive purpose to get people away from the Society of St. Pius X. Ain't that nice? So, uh, an organization like this does not have the blessing of the Holy Spirit because the Church does not do things like this. The Church does not. So, these, these four bishops, thank God they are young, but these four bishops are under a constant stress, they are in constant traveling, and uh, I thank the Lord we have six bishops now because there's the fifth one, Monsignor Angel, in the Diocese of Campos in Brazil, which would be a story for another lecture. And uh, Monsignor Lasso, a retired bishop from the Philippines, God bless him, who has joined the Society of St. Pius X. This emergency, which can easily be proven in canon law, this emergency caused Rome to found a new organization, the Fraternity of St. Peter. Some of the priests, most of them, by the way, not in disagreement with the consecrations, the Episcopal consecrations, that's another one of those tiny little dishonesties, or deviations from truth, or as you put it in politically correct speak, untruth. Uh, these, most of them didn't leave the, for the, the Society of St. Pius X because they were against the Episcopal consecrations, but because they wanted, had it, wanted to leave anyway. So then now they had a new chance. And uh, the Fraternity of St. Peter, was founded for the only and exclusive purpose to get people away from the Society of St. Pius X. Ain't that nice? So, uh, an organization like this does not have the blessing of the Holy Spirit because the Church does not do things like this. The Church does not do that. Enough about the fraternity of St. Peter. Why did I say before that Archbishop Lefebvre consecrated those four bishops with the will of the Pope? What is the will of the Pope? What is it? Now, at, at the, the present Pope is a man who says, Christ is really substantially present on the altar in Mass. And then he celebrates a Mass that never mentions this fact. 
So what does he mean? In another one of his encyclicals, uh, the Pope says, only if you have the full Catholic truth, you can be saved. And then in another place he says, Christ does not deny salvation to the efforts of, efforts, mind you, of Protestant churches. Doesn't mean the individual Protestant. Maybe. But the efforts of Protestant churches, never. So what does he mean? Well, if I'm nice to the Pope and I'm respectful to the Pope, and I have to choose between one of his two opinions, I will choose the one that confirms with church tradition. Now, if the Pope says to Archbishop Lefebvre, I don't want you to ordain these bishops, but at the same time, in writing, he has signed the new code of canon law, which in canon 1725 says, the highest law of the church is the salvation of the souls, and Archbishop Lefebvre was able to prove that the salvation of the souls depended on correct theology, on correct confessors, and on the only right of the Roman Catholic Church, he had the will of the Pope, the real will of the Pope, the will of the uh, vicar of Christ, the will of the successor to St. Peter, not the will of Karl Wojtyla, John Paul II. Again, another one of those contradictions. So what, what would he have uh, gone according to? I mean, you don't choose the heresy, you choose the orthodoxy. Okay? So he went on, and as a matter of fact, at the Episcopal Consecrations, the 30th of June, 1988, the Mandatum Apostolicum was read. The Mandatum Apostolicum is a letter, and there's a prescribed formula for it, that says, I, John Paul II, bishops of the bishops of the church, uh, a vicar of Christ, uh, bishop of Rome, archbishop of the, etc., primate of Italy, and uh, primate of, uh, of the West, and Patriarch of the West, and so on, and Servant uh, of the Servants of God, hereby uh, allow you, Bishop so-and-so, or Archbishop so-and-so, or Cardinal so-and-so, or anybody in good standing with the Catholic Church, to consecrate the following priest, da-da-da, da-da-da, to the bishophood. Archbishop Lefebvre, of course, could not put in the name John Paul II, so he said the Church, exactly according to canon law. If my bishop refuses to give uh, faculties of confession to me, and one of you comes to me and says, Father, I want to confess to a Catholic priest. Could you hear my confession? I got, in that moment, latest in that moment, I get the faculty from the church, and that is declared in canon law. Archbishop Lefebvre received the faculties to consecrate those bishops because of the emergency situation in the church provided by canon law. These were canonically correct consecrations. You understand this? And that's basically the story of the Society of St. Pius X. And uh, they're the only ones who, unlike me in rather milder terms, but very definitely, acknowledge the fact that the present Pope's encyclicals are packed with heresy. The Fraternity of St. Peter officially agrees with Vatican II, and officially agrees with the present Pope's encyclicals. So they are not Catholics, officially, objectively. They are formally not Catholics, formally. In their hearts, I don't know. I have friends in the fraternity of St. Peter's who are good priests, but uh, formally, they are not Catholics. Formally, they are in heresy because they sign and affirm officially, formally, objectively, heresy. Which means Vatican II. Refer to yesterday's lecture. And uh, the same with the Institute of Christ the King. The Institute of Christ the King, founded by Monsignor Vak, and because I was stupid enough not to see what was going on, and I like to have this on tape because Monsignor Vak never tells anybody about it, the Institute of Christ the King could only be founded because I was, I was the bum who made uh, it possible that he had four priests ordained. I'm not going to say here how I did it. And uh, so he was able to start the Institute of Christ the King because now he had six priests instead of two, uh, unfortunately. Because as, as much as I like the Institute of Christ the King, as much as I like their priests, and I really like them, one of them is my best friend, Monsignor Vak celebrated with the Pope Second Eucharistical Prayer together with Dom Gérard Calvé, the abbot of the Benedictine Monastery in France that he founded to celebrate the old rite. They celebrate the 1965 rite, if you call that the old rite, I don't know. And both of them can't celebrate it with the Pope. Something, <coughs> pardon me, 
something which in the old liturgy you had only at Episcopal consecrations and uh, in quite a different form of today than today, they both come celebrated with the Pope's second Eucharistical prayer. I have seen the picture. So you know what's going on. You cannot say that the Novus Ordo is against divine law and then celebrate it for di diplomatical reasons. Uh -uh. Either you mistakenly say this is the liturgy of the church, then you may, might as well celebrate it, or you say what I say, it's against divine law, and that's the reason why I'm not celebrating it, then you can also not do it for uh, diplomatical reasons. <coughs> and if they do not say, if the fraternity of St. Peter, and if the Institute of Christ the King do not say that the Novus Ordo is against divine law, then why do they celebrate the old, ra the old mass? Because it's more beautiful? Okay, they're running a museum. Against divine law. <laughs> if it was not against divine law, on direct commandment of my bishop, I would have to celebrate it, right? If the Pope tells me that uh, in a Dominican monastery somewhere they don't have a priest left, it's only brothers, and please, Father has to celebrate the Dominican rite for them, I will say, yes, sir, anytime you want. Dominican right, the old Dominican right, of course, you know? <laughs> uh, fine. I have to obey. The reason why I cannot obey the Pope is because I'm bound to the divine law. And the new right is against the divine law. Therefore, I'm not allowed to celebrate it. I commit a sin if I celebrate it. I did celebrate it. I didn't know. So subjectively, I did not commit a sin. Objectively, objectively it was horrible what I did. I'm ashamed that I didn't find out earlier. I'm glad I didn't have to confess it. So the, uh, these, are, these people are running, a, they're running a museum. Anybody who receives his faculties and his blessings from Ecclesia Dei, oh, except for useful purposes, I got the decree of Ecclesia Dei here. Now this is on tape and they might take it back, but I'm deadly afraid of this. Here is the, the, the decree of the Ecclesia Dei Commission that allows me to celebrate Mass privately in the old rite. Ha ha! But sometimes it's useful. I don't believe in this. It's null and void, but uh, sometimes it's useful. And uh, if they want to take it back, let them take it back. Okay, I got my travel luggage uh, uh, altar. Uh, I have celebrated Mass in hotel rooms. This is the situation we're in. We're back to the catacombs, thanks to Paul VI. And uh, <coughs> the reason why I mention the Fraternity of St. Peter and the Institute of Christ the King is not to put them down, especially not the members. Monsignor Vak, the founder of the Institute of Christ the King, is a friend of mine for now 18 or 19 years. And some of the priests of the Institute are friends of mine, and some of the priests in the fraternity of St. Peter are friends of mine. Friendship usually is, especially among men, something that does not necessarily concern religion and politics. With me, a lot more politics than religion. So I have Episcopalian friends and I love them, but they're Republicans. And uh, so the... Uh, the reason why I mention them is to explain to you why I want you, if it is possible, to go to the masses of St. Pius X. Now, if you happen, I don't know the geographical situation here, if you happen to live around the corner of a chapel of the Institute of Christ the King or the Fraternity of St. Peter, and the, the chapel of the Society of St. Pius X is two hours away, of course you're allowed to go to the, uh, provided it's the old mass and they don't give communion in the hand there because like they do in indult masses. Or if you live around the corner of the indult mass and they do not commit sacrilege there, you're allowed to go there. But, I warn you, first of all, there's two dangers. First of all, in their sermons you cannot be sure you will get the, do the, the doctrine of the church. Now, with the Society of St. Pius X, even if a sermon there might be incredibly boring it will never be against the doctrine of the church with the indult mass and the fraternity of St. Peter there's a probability that they will, they will tell you the truth but you don't know and there's another thing when you go to communion with the, with the society of St. Pius X you definitely know that the little holes distributed to you were consecrated by one of the priests of the society of St. Pius X within the old mass with the indult mass, you might get the host that some liberal hippie 1968 generation priest celebrate, uh, in an invalid celebration attempted to consecrate. So they're only cookies, crackers. With the fraternity of St. Peter, you can go to communion without hesitation. 
because if it's their own chapel, if they are not just uh, borrowing the chapel, if, it, if they have their own chapel, then it's only them who celebrate there, so the, 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 the blessed sacrament is valid. Now, as far as the issue of validity is concerned, I highly recommend you to read both of Father Trinchard's books, uh, who explains uh, in, in painful detail and very precisely and quoting all the necessary authorities why uh, the new mass in the English language is with the highest probability invalid. Invalid that means the sacrament is not taking place. It's just like going to an Episcopalian church except that the rite with the Episcopalians is a lot nicer. And uh, I, uh, there's no time and space here to explain uh, the, the issue of validity. Read Father Trinchard's books. However, you have to be careful. If you can't go to any, anywhere else but to the indult mass, go, but don't go to communion. You don't have to. The church says you must go to communion once a year. Well, once a year you will be able to drive three or four hours uh, to the next chapel, uh, if you have to go that far, to the next chapel of St. Pius X and receive a definitely, positively valid communion there. See, the thing is, I'm not saying that 99.9% .9 of the, the, the churches or parishes in this country do not celebrate Mass anymore, do not have the, the Blessed Sacrament or Tabernacle anymore. I do not say that. I only say one thing, which innocent, innocent, Pope Innocent III said, you always must, now this is, uh, this is official church doctrine, you always must adapt the safer course. You are not allowed to take chances with the sacraments. You're not allowed to. If you take chances with the sacraments, you're in sin. So if you don't know about the validity, stay away from communion. You don't have to. That's one of the greatest mistakes in our days. I don't see people going to confession, but I always see them going to communion. Either they're all very, 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 very holy, or they don't care. <laughs>